Hi everyone. Oh, I'm so sorry that we're not in the room again. Uh, it's so frustrating. This is day seven for me since my first positive uh, test. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm still uh, testing positive because if I'd tested negative yesterday and today, I would have been clear to come. But can't do it. So I'm really sorry. I hope you're having the most wonderful time together and uh, looking forward to being with everyone again next week. We are back in 2 Samuel and we're in chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And I'm really excited to be back in this series. I really loved listening to Lewis last week. I hope you're enjoying the story and what God is speaking to you uh, through it. Today we're talking about unity and God's heart for unity, his love for his people to be united as one. And let's be honest, division these days seems to be everywhere and unity seems to be really rare. Now, that's been in our faces the last couple of years, but I actually think in so many ways, it's always been true. It was true for David as he was continuing to deal with all of the divisions that were going on in Israel, particularly between his house, the house of David and the house of Saul. Even though Saul has now died, that continue, continues to rumble on and we'll see a bit more of that in a minute. And it was certainly true of Martin Luther King in the 1950s in America. It was Martin Luther King Memorial Day on Monday and I realised I've never read his autobiography. So I thought, okay, good opportunity. I will use my COVID uh, lock-in as well as uh, it being Martin Luther King Memorial Day and I'm going to listen actually to the audiobook of his autobiography. And I've loved it. It's been so challenging, incredible to see his determination and his ability to just keep carrying on, to keep doing what is right, uh, even though he was facing so much opposition and adversity. Early in his story, not long after the courage of Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott, he received a phone call around about midnight one night. And the voice at the end of the phone sounded threatening immediately and he said by the end of the call if you're not out of Montgomery within three days we're going to blow your brains out and we're going to blow up your house. Not surprisingly Martin Luther King can't get back to sleep and he's frightened, bewildered, he's upset, he's thinking about his family he said, I was weak. He said, he realised no one could help him except God. So he prayed. And this is how he recollects his prayer that night in his kitchen in a sermon a number of years later. He says, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think the cause is right. And Lord, I must confess, I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage it seemed in that moment I heard in my inner man a voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even unto the ends of the world. I tell you, I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder rolling. I've felt sin's breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus saying, still to fight on. He promised never to leave me alone. No, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. Never to leave me alone. No, never alone. I wish I could say that with Martin Luther King's auditory ability. <laughs> A few nights later, his house had been bombed. And he would receive up to 40 death threat threats every day until the day of his death. In all of this, he finds the strength not to give in to the temptation to run away from the calling that God has put on his life. Because he knows Jesus is with him. In 1 Samuel 2, we're going to see two characters here who do give in to that temptation to go away from God or to go ahead of God 
and the text is screaming at us, choose neither of those. Choose not to go away from God or to go ahead of God and instead, like Jesus has shown us, go the way of God. From verses 8 through 17, we see Abner going away from God. Now, if you've been tracking along with the story, you would expect that right about now, David is going to take the throne. I mean, isn't this what he's been waiting for? Saul has died. God surely has opened the window of opportunity for David to take his God-given place on the throne. Surely it's come. But even though the tribe of Judah almost immediately enthroned David, the rest of the tribes are waiting to see what the power plays might be. The first two words of our passage in verse 8 are ominous though. And at the beginning of this part of the story, we find out by verse 11 that there are going to be another seven and a half years before David finally takes the throne. Those first two words in verse 8, meanwhile, Abner. Abner was Saul's commander and he's probably the most powerful man in Israel. And he crowns Ishbosheth, Saul's only surviving son after that defeat at Gilboa, as king over Saul's house. Abner was playing his hand. He's desperate to hold on to the power that he's got and he recognises he needs the house of Saul to be in charge for him to still have his power. Abner and his men went out, verse 12 it says. Hmm, I smell trouble. (laughs) They were off to flex their military muscle to show David and his men who was boss. It was like a military exercise over the Korean Peninsula. Joab, commander of David's men, comes out to meet them at the pool of Gibeon. Now that's where Abner decides to suggest a bit of sport, a gladiatorial contest. They were to fight 12 men and 12 men from either side just with a dagger each and to see who would win. Now this kind of thing is actually never recorded anywhere else in Israel's history which is really interesting and that is most probably because it just doesn't fit with the law of Moses, it's not compatible. But all the nations around them, like the Philistines, are practicing these things. And there's another indication that the house of Saul is not looking to the way of God and to the kingdom of God, but looking to the kingdoms around them, the powerhouses in that moment and thinking that they would rather be like that and trust in that kind of power and authority rather than the power and authority of the kingdom of God. Sometimes I watch worship videos or preaching online and honestly, I wonder, have we fallen into some of the same traps? Are we really holding out God's ways in contrast to the ways of the world or Are we actually looking to pursue the ways of the world and then adding some kind of spirituality to it to accompany these times? The number of men picked from each side of this worldly contest was not insignificant. It was for God's kingdom, right? Both... Saul's house and David's house wanted to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel and so they picked 12 fighters to represent themselves because they want to show that the house of David should rule over the 12 or the house of Saul should rule over the 12. They might as well have had neon lights up there saying, fight for the kingdom of Yahweh. But it was in name only for God. This is really about them. This was really about their own pride. Joab in his foolishness saying yes to this contest and Abner trying to show his power and his might. And his 2 Samuel commentary, Dale Ralph Davis puts it this way. Abner is not far from any of us. Let Abner preach to you. Let him tell you that it is possible to know the truth but not embrace the truth, to hold the truth and yet assault the truth. 
Oh, <laughs> the result of the fight was disastrous. Martin Luther King said this, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools and perish they did. All 24 of the fighters are killed. When God's people turn against themselves, everyone suffers. God was building one house, not two, and he's showing them here. You need to stop trying to build the house of David or the house of Saul. It should have been that you were building the house of God. The call of God's people is to unite around him, not around one character or around one way of doing things. God's people find their unification in him. That is how we dwell in unity. When we build our own houses and do not look to him as our builder, we quickly are going to get ourselves into pretty serious trouble. Solomon, David's son, he'd later write this in Psalm 27. Sorry, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. When God is no longer the master builder in our hearts, then infighting and power grabs, of course, are going to become commonplace. If we want unity, we need to be wholly committed to God's ways and not our own. Unity requires our collective direction of travel to be the way of God and not the way of me. Then from verses 18 through 25, we move away from Abner and we start to focus on Joab and his brothers who go ahead of God. So if Abner's temptation was to run away from God's plans, Joab's was to run ahead of them. So after fierce fighting amongst God's own people between the house of Saul and the house of David, Joab and his men defeat Abner and his men and Abner goes on the run. Joab starts chasing him down. Joab and his brothers, David's nephews, had grown impatient. And here was a golden opportunity to take down the big dog in the house of Saul. Ishbosheth might have been king of the other tribes, but it was the one who crowned him, Abner, who had the power, the military commander. If David wasn't going to claim his rightful throne, if he wasn't going to take this window of opportunity, we're going to do it for him. Waiting often feels like a total waste of time. Just me? I struggle with waiting. But when God says wait, we can know that he is producing something in us that is worthy of every moment in the waiting. What is God asking you to wait on? What has God put on your heart? What has God had prophesied over you several times and it's just not quite yet happened? What is that? Whatever it is, wait. It's worth the waiting. You might feel like David when he says in a, uh, Psalm 119, my eyes fail looking for your promise. Is that how you feel? Do you feel like you're failing and looking for God's promises? You can't see them coming true yet? Well, trust him. The waiting will be worth it. For some of you, the heartache, heartache in the waiting is extreme. Even still, please don't squander the gift of waiting. I've often wasted seasons of waiting. I first heard God speak to me about leading churches when I was 18 years old. By the time I was finishing my theological training at 23, I was this passionate young leader, both entirely confident in my calling and yet entirely unqualified in my character, wisdom and ability. Of course, I did not see the second part, not surprisingly, at the time, just that God had called me and so it was time to get on with it. <laughs> 
So I'm in my final year and instead of focusing on what God's given me to do, using the preparation time uh, wisely, I'm like trying to get on with ministries, starting new things under the noses of church leaders without even talking to them, moaning about the way that things are done. Man, I look back and I think, what a fool. And thank you, Lord, for some really patient leaders who didn't crush me. I wasn't wise enough to know that God is in the waiting, working something of much more worth than I could ever achieve by pushing ahead of his timing. Now Asahel, this brother of uh, Joab who chases down Abner in verses 18 and, and 19, he's like the allegorical picture of the, the part of us that wants to force the issue and get it done before God's time. He pursues God's promises with determination, speed, focus, self-reliance. He's going for it. Now he runs out ahead and he chases Abner down in no time. And it seems he had no idea what the consequences were going to be for him as he chases Abner down. Instead of waiting on God's timing and enjoying all the blessings of David's rule that would come in time, in God's time, Asahel's over-exuberance and self-reliance ran him straight into Abner's spear and his premature death. It's brutal. But spiritually, that is often what happens. Joab, Abishai and Asahel could have done with the words of one of David's songs coming on the radio in that moment, right before they go on this great pursuit. Psalm 27 Verses 13 through 14 say this, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. The contrast with David was stark. Despite being taken from the fields as a boy to be anointed by Samuel as king, who would shepherd God's flock, by 1 Samuel 16, he was a boy at the time. He's only now just been anointed as king and only over Judah, not over all of Israel. And he's just turning 30 years old. He had already been given opportunities to kill and take uh, the throne, kill Saul and take the throne for himself. Do you remember that moment? And he's got that opportunity in 1 Samuel 24. And instead of killing Saul, he takes a piece of his tunic. And he even feels bad for taking a piece of his tunic because he takes something of his royal robe. I mean, it's extraordinary. Saul has been chasing him down. He's been living in caves, hiding, living like a wild man because Saul has unjustly pursued him, knowing that God has anointed David as the new king. And yet he's to wait another seven and a half years from this moment, and he's still not forcing the issue. He still waits on God. What a great reminder for us, as we wait for God's timing in our building situation. Now, I know we're talking about it quite a bit just now. We don't want to talk about it all the time. We really don't. But this is a really critical moment for us. Do we have faith to wait on God's timing for whatever's next, whatever that looks like? Do we trust him for that? Or are we going to force the issue? We could come up with some strategy for finding something and creating something that, that maybe looks like It could be God's strategy, but actually it's only a name only because we've not really waited on God. Or are we truly going to wait on God? We got a couple of prophetic words back in 2018 and 2019 when we were just beginning as a church. And we've held on to these because they've been helpful in every one of these kind of moments. One of them was of stepping stones over the Clyde. 
So um, this person had a picture uh, for us of stepping stones that would appear in front of us and we would leap onto the stepping stones as we went across to the other side, as God uh, took us to what he had for us as a church. And we would take our time in doing that, but we had to wait for every single stepping stone to come up before we could then leap onto the next one. So there's a moment of courage and faith that is needed to, to jump and we need to get ready for that jump. But what we, what we can't do is jump before it's even there. Just try and leap to the other side as if we can make it without God's help. We need God's help. We need to wait on God. We need to wait on his timing. And there was another word of traffic lights. And we were approaching traffic lights. And each time we approached traffic lights, the traffic lights would turn from red to green. But again, you can't accelerate and put the foot down until it turns green. We've got to wait on God's timing for him to turn the light green and for us to accelerate forward, to have that moment of faith and courage. Waiting on God is hard and it can be frustrating and uncertain, but God is at work in those moments, shaping us and preparing us. When we jump ahead, ahead with false starts, we forfeit the blessing of the weight and break the unity of God's people. Waiting is something to be done together. We must help each other to stay together. And don't be like Asahel who is willing to run out ahead of everybody else instead of us going together at the right time, waiting for the right moment. We don't sprint ahead in our own abilities, our own self-reliance. Instead, we go together in God's timing. Waiting on God is always worth your time. And from 2.26 through to 3.1, we see something of a different way. We see something of David, even though we don't directly see David in the passage here until we get to chapter 3, verse 1. And we see him going the way of God. So Abner had gone away from God. Joab had gone ahead of God. But David had chosen to go the way of God. That is what convinces Joab that Abner was right. No matter how disingenuous his sweet talking was in verse 26, he sounded like David. The sword does devour and in all this infighting, it will only increase bitterness between the two houses. Not least that Abner has now just killed Joab's brother. Joab's conscience was pricked. He knew this wasn't David's way. This wasn't God's way. And so he calls the trumpet, he blows the trumpet to call off the troops. It was weak in the eyes of the world. I mean, what are you doing? Here's your opportunity. You've hunted him down, now finish him off. But God has a glorious way of turning our weakness to strength. And that is why God blesses David's house here. Chapter three, verse one, which goes from strength to strength. Weakness precedes glory in the kingdom of God. That is God's way. Around a thousand years later, a Davidic king promised by God would be born into poverty choosing weakness all the way to the cross. I love the way the Apostle Paul talks about it in his letter to the Corinthians, his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. He says he was crucified, Jesus was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. David's weakness to strength story that we see repeated again and again is of grace. It's like grace on repeat throughout his life. And it's supposed to be a precursor to the Davidic king, to the stump of Jesse, to the son of David, to Jesus born in the town of Bethlehem, at the town of David and raised up king of the Jews. It is the cross that makes it possible for all people to be unified. 
no other narrative, no other belief system can unite people like the cross does. It flattens tribalism, it flattens nationalism, it flattens class, political views, privilege, status, hierarchy, sin, guilt, shame, and unites everyone under a new name, and that name is Jesus. That is the truth that genuine unity can form around. It doesn't work otherwise. That's why democracy crusades and ethics based on Christian teaching do not work and last unless there are significant numbers of believers following Jesus on the ground. What makes this unity possible is people trusting that because he went to the cross for me and I will be raised to glory with him through his resurrection life, I can now take up my cross as I wait for him to return in glory. Do you see that? Because Jesus died on the cross and was raised to new life and will return in glory, we can take up our own cross knowing that we will be resurrected to new and glorious life forever. That is the only way that we will find the strength to be a people who embrace weakness to find strength. That is the way of unity. Martin Luther King put it this way, Christianity has always insisted that the cross we bear always precedes the crown we wear. Jesus gave all of himself freely for us without needing anything in return. And so we give away meals and possessions and money and time without needing anything in return. God is faithful to forgive and we never deserve that forgiveness. And so we forgive others even when they hold a grudge against us. Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. And so we do not need people to even like us before we love them. We are not out to prove ourselves because all we are has already been proved in Christ. We do not work for rewards that the world can offer because our reward is Jesus and his glory. I could go on. Weakness is the way of God because through the cross, it leads to glory and strength. He is our prize. He is our glory. Because we love him and we're joined to him and we're united to him because he's with us, as Martin Luther King put it in his prayer that night. We can take up our own cross. We can embrace weakness, knowing that our strength is found in him. I was weak, Martin Luther King said that night after that death threat. And in moments like that, when it all gets very real, let's not be tempted to be like Abner and go away from God or like Joab and go ahead of God, but to be committed like David to go the way of God. And that way is the way of weakness that Jesus lived so perfectly all the way to the cross. And that is our shared story, that we find strength and can dwell together in unity. So as Johnny comes up to lead you in communion, let me finish with the vision of the Apostle Paul for unity in the church in Galatians. He says it in Galatians 3, 26 through 28. So in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is, nor is there male and female. For you are all 
one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise.